Hi everyone. Once again, welcome back to SJS classes. Thank you so much for joining me. I understand that some of you regularly, you know, are with me to watch my live sessions. Now, what you are doing is you are acknowledging your gratitude for the effort a particular teacher takes, or teachers in general take you know, to give you lessons. I'm really happy that some of you are consistent. That some of you regularly go through the video lessons. It's not just my students at Saint Michael's, but also you know, students uh, in other colleges and perhaps other viewers and subscribers uh, of my YouTube channel as well. Let me thank you for doing this in a consistent manner. For the past few weeks, we have been discussing the paper 20th century Malayalam literature and English translation. We discussed 10 poems as part of this particular paper. Through the earlier live sessions that I did, we discussed a few short stories as well. Today we will discuss yet another short story. We have a particular format. That is how we carry out the business. I introduce to you the author first and then we move on to the short story. I had spoke about how important introductory sessions on authors are in the live session that I did yesterday. And please don't skip these portions, these areas where I introduce the poet, where I introduce the author. It's important that you understand the background or the historical backdrop in which a particular work was written. And when we come to the short story that we are about to discuss today, it's very important that we go through the historical background during which the author wrote. Because what we have here today is a short story that reminds us of a time when we had a particular caste system that was followed, a hierarchical division that was there in the society and how you know, people were treated in that particular system. Perhaps in the next short story that we will read to, we will find this you know, hierarchical division of society that was there in our society and perhaps uh, is still there in the society in overt and covert manners. So the short story that we are going to discuss today is a short story written by Lelidambega Andarjana. The short story is titled Wooden Cradles. So before we uh, start reading the short story, let's have a look into the biographical as well as literary details of this particular author. Lelidambiga Andarjanam, born in Kottarakara in the year 1909, is widely recognized as one of the first women to win acclaim in the early 20th century as a writer in modern Malayalam literature. Born in a progressive Brahmin family, now I say progressive Brahmin family because she received her primary education from private tutors at a time when education was actually forbidden for Nambudri women. So she received her formal education, her primary education to be specific, during a time when education was actually forbidden for Nambudri women. So that is why I said she was born in a progressive Brahmin family. So she was born in this progressive Brahmin family in South Kerala. She was one of the few Brahmin women who were exposed to modern learning and ways of life at a time when traditional seclusion of women was the rule in her community. 
This is why I said earlier that it's very important that you understand the historical backdrop you know, during which or historical time period during which a particular author wrote. And as far as Lelidambiya Andarjanam is concerned, it's very important that you have an understanding regarding the historical backdrop. Because she survived, she wrote, she gained education during a period when traditional seclusion of women was a rule in the community. She was initially renowned as a powerful voice which questioned the place of women in the traditional Malayali Brahmin way of life in Kerala. She was an author and a social reformist who was deeply influenced by Mahatma Gandhi and the nationalist movement. She belongs to that group of early 20th century Malayalam writers who combined creativity with social commitment. She even began her literary career with a write-up on Mahatma Gandhi published under the title Abhinava Partha Sarathi. So she was so influenced by Mahatma Gandhi as well as the nationalistic movements that, you know, uh, rose during that time that she began her literary career with a uh, write upon Mahatma Gandhi, the father of our nation. And the work is titled Abhinava Partha Sarathi. The term Andarjanam is a Nambudri caste name. It literally means one who lives in the interiors. It was primarily this women's world that Lalidambiga delineated with great compassion and boundless imagination in over 100 short stories written over a period of 40 years between the late 1930s and 1970s. In shedding light on the inhuman indignities suffered by Nambudri women in Kerala, Lelidambika stories shed light on all toxic patriarchal structures and held them accountable for the gendered abuse of women for all times. So even though she wrote about a particular period, how women were ill-treated during a particular period, the stories that she wrote attain some kind of an universalization effect. It's applicable to any woman, all women who suffer under a patriarchal society. The term patriarchy is nothing new to you. It's not at all new to you. You have come across this term perhaps in different forms that exist in our society. Perhaps uh, when you read Kamala Das' poem and introduction. So this term is not at all new to you. In 1935, she wrote the play Punar Janmam, espousing the message of widow remarriage. Lelidanjali, her poetry collection, and Ambiganjali, her short story collection, was published in 1937. Her stories especially her short stories, are marked by their deep sensitivity to the problems faced by women, especially Nambudri women, in the feudal and patriarchal setup of the 20th century Kerala. Her other short story collections include Kilivadil Lude, Kannirinde Punjiri, Irubadu Varshatini Shesham, Dheerendu Manjumdarude Amma, Pavitra Modidam and Lelidambiga Andarjanathinde Kadagal Samburnam. It came out in 2009. Her autobiography, Atma Kadaku Uramukham, was published in 1979. The inhuman life Nambudri women lived within the Illams received a more extended treatment in the novel Akne Sakshi. Perhaps you are all aware of this title and perhaps this was how you were introduced to the writer Lelida Bega Andarjanam through the work Akne Sakshi which came out in 1977. This work attracted a lot of public and critical attention. This work was greatly appreciated by the literary world. It won for its author a number of prestigious awards including the 1977 Sahitya Academy Award the Kerala Sahitya Academy Award and the Vailar Award. This great literary figure, this great personality, she breathed her last on February 6, 1987. 
So that is all regarding the author. Now let me give you a short introduction to the story that we are about to read. The story Wooden Cradles is a tribute to all those servants turned foster mothers who dedicate their lives for the well-being of the little children that they take care of. So the primary or the important character or the protagonist of the story is a foster mother, is a nani. You have a poem written by Kamala Das with the same title, title Nani. So we had such characters earlier, perhaps we have such characters even now in our society where we have, you know, both the parents working and you have a particular person to take care of the child at your house. Earlier, servants used to do that. As of now, I believe we have people who are, you know, assigned with that particular task alone. So this particular story is a dedication to all such, you know, servants turned foster mothers who actually dedicate their life for the protection and well-being of the child. The wooden cradle, in the end, becomes a symbol of all such foster mothers. The narrator of the story fondly recollects how Nangeli Penna, Nangeli Penna is the foster mother or the Aya or the Nani in this particular story. So the narrator fondly recollects how Nangeli Penna, the servant in her house, was a mother, caretaker, teacher and a playmate, playmate all at the same time and how she sustained it even in the face of rejection from the little ones and indifference on the part of the parents. So as the children grew up, you know, they you know, turned their face against this particular person who used to take care of them, who used to dedicate her life for the well-being of the children. And also you know, the parents were, were you know, indifferent to this particular person. And that is the kind of social setup that we had then. The story on the whole is a result of the indelible mark that Nangeli Pendle left in the heart of the narrator. So that is uh, the introduction to the short story. Now let's start reading the story. These are events that took place a long time ago. Events that go as far back as the memory of a 30-year-old woman can take her. So we have the narrator. She is 30 year old woman and she states that, you know, she is going to narrate some events that happened in her past. You all know how much a little child between the ages of 3 and 9, especially a little girl, delights in listening to some telling old legends. Someone telling old legends. Now, yes, we do know because we all have that, you know, want to listen to stories. Perhaps in our childhood or perhaps even now. And if she has an old woman servant at her command, her happiness is complete. She asks a thousand questions and must be given reasons for everything that happens. So we know how curious children are. They have too many questions that perhaps we can answer or perhaps which are unanswerable. But we do definitely get questions from children. You must have personal experiences of that. So let's look at some of the questions that this particular girl asks or the narrator asked when she was a little child. Whom does the kitchen cat call out to when it mews all the time? Why are the cat and the dog at each other's throats? Is it because they are brothers? So look at the kind of you know curiosity that the narrator had when she was a child. She used to ask all these questions when she was a child to the woman servant whom she says that was at her command. When the mother sparrow goes out from the nest every morning in search of food, aren't the baby sparrows afraid to be by themselves? Doesn't the sky mother get furious when her children overturn her box of vermilion every day, morning and evening? No, the sky is picturized as a woman. And her mother who adorns herself with vermilion. Vermilion is the sindurum that you have. Which you probably wear on the forehead. And her children overturn the box in which vermilion is kept. And the reference is uh, probably to the colors that appear in the sky during the scan dawn. 
and so they sprout endlessly the young tendrils of curiosity so thus sprouts numerous questions out of this young child and all these questions are you know raised against this old woman servant as of now we don't know what the name of the servant is but we will come to know of that very soon the cherished darling of a wealthy family this is what the narrator was when she was a child the cherished darling of a wealthy family can exercise many unjust privileges over the servants in the household she will ride nothing but a human horse you have the kind of you know freedom that uh, or the narrator explains the kind of freedom that she used to enjoy as she was the as she was everyone's darling during her childhood she must be told a dozen stories before she will drink a glass of milk at the end of a crowded day if she must desist from further mischief desist means to restrain yourself from to prevent uh, you know doing something from if she must desist from further mischief and go to sleep her old slave must sing every song she knows so look at how the woman servant is being described she is described as an old slave because she has to dance according to the tunes of the child she is actually a puppet in the hands of the child Uncle Moon was exhausted for he had been wandering all day in search of food for his starving wife and children. So look at the kind of picturization that the narrator does or the author does. You know Uncle Moon probably the you know descriptions are done from the point of view of a child. The author says Uncle Moon was exhausted for he had been wandering all day in search of food for his starving wife and children. At last by dusk he had found a handful of broken rice grains on his way home across the vast sky he slipped and the rice grains scattered and became stars now this particular paragraph is you know quite typical of how the entire story is written from the point of view of a child the author views everything through the eyes of a little child and look how beautifully the narrates the narrator narrates the coming of night time the coming of the moon the coming of the stars in the sky during the night time the little one interrupts to ask innocently and are the children still crying for food so this is the question that she has in the end this is the concern that the little child has at the end now are the children still crying for food when the sky turns dark when lightning flashes and the thunder roars we know that the lord of the skies is preparing for war now these are stories which uh, you know elders narrate to young ones perhaps you know even you will have such stories to share i am sure because you might have you know scared a child by telling a particular story or made a child do something you know by telling a particular story so we are you know re-experiencing the you know our childhood when we read this particular short story the great one the son set out in his royal chariot to marry the daughter of the lord of the skies a demon stopped him on the way and would not let him go on the lord of the skies whirled his sword the thunder you hear is the demon roaring in pain so look at the interpretation of the thunder and lightning that we see uh, in the sky this is the explanation that was given to the child and the rain drops you see are the tears of the bride and her attendants distraught with the fear distraught means agitated disturbed distraught with the fear that the wedding will never take place so this is the story behind the rain this is a story that the child might say when it rains or when it thunders infant logic must clear a doubt and did the wedding take place so this is what the child wanted to know earlier she wanted to know whether the children were still crying for food and once she heard this story she wants to know whether the wedding took place we all learned our first lessons in life from such women it was forbidden to swim in the tang nestor because two people once drowned in it 
If little girls went to play under the ilanyi tree, a yakshi would tear them to pieces. If you played with your shadow, you would be born a demon in your next life. So look at the kind of stories that were being, you know, uh, conveyed to these little children. You know, you were forbidden to swim in a particular tank, water tank, next door, because two people had drowned in it. Now, if you play under the Elenji tree, a yakshi would tear them to pieces. A ghost would come and tear them to pieces. If you played with your shadow, you will be born a demon in your next life. As we approach the last stage of childhood, these old women begin to seem as useless to us as antiquated wooden cradles. Antiquated means extremely old. Now this is where we come to an understanding regarding what or who wooden cradles refer to and why the author has used it as her title for the story. Because you know, once you become an adult, you understand that these old women begin to seem as useless to us as antiquated wooden cradles. This is the moment from where the author equates wooden cradles with such nannies, with such foster mothers. Their hands suddenly feel coarse. Coarse means something which has a rough surface. Now, earlier, those were the hands which took care of you. But as of now, because you are an adult, because you grew up, now, you feel that her hands are very coarse and rough. And yet the crude images that those roughened nails once etched on the tender walls of a child's mind continue to gleam fitfully beneath the veneer of time, now clear, now indistinct. Veneer means the coating, a particular coating that you find somewhere. Here you have the veneer of time, a coating being done by the time, the cover-up that is done by the time. You still find, you know, such, uh, or you, you can still experience her love, her affection, the care, she had, the care that she gave you, you know, even when you grow up, grew up. Once I was 13, I had no time for Nangelipan. This is the first time perhaps that we come across the name Nangelipan. Uh, she is the woman servant in the house. Her house was a good 10 miles from ours. She had come to us when she was 11 years old. So look at the age in which you know, Nangeli Panna came to the author's house as a servant. She was only 11 years old. And this is why I earlier said that you have to also understand the social setup. Earlier, we used to have such setup uh, in our society. You know, people from lower class or lower caste, they were used as servants in higher uh, caste people's house and Nangeli Pannu was brought to the author's house when she was 11 years old when my father was still a child she had lived with us a part of the family for 62 years till she was old and helpless no one in her family had cared to arrange a match for her so she had never married Although she was unmarried, she always had children whom she could call her own. Their jewels were hers and their toys too. She shared their illness and all their pleasures. One by one, each child in the family became her charge. As she relinquished each little one who had learned to walk on its own, another newborn was placed in her arms. She would hold it close and proudly chant, God gave this little baby to parents who longed for one. God gave this little baby to Nangeli who longed for one. So this is how she took care of all the children that had uh, been you know, given to her. She came to the author's house when she was 11 years old. You know, when the author's father was still a child and she lived there for 62 years until she was old and you know, helpless. She was not married because nobody in her family cared to you know, get her married. She remained an unmarried person. But she had these children in her life uh, and she was very happy with these uh, children. Uh, their jewels, the children's, uh, the children's jewels were hers and their toys too. Which means that you know, she was quite engaged with these little children. Uh, when one child grew up, she had another baby to take care of. And she used to, you know, chant these particular lines. God gave this little baby to parents who longed for one. 
God gave this little baby to Nangeli who longed for one. So she had this aspiration, she had this crave, desire to be a mother. And she materialized that particular desire by taking care of the babies that were given to her. She had sung generations of babies to sleep with her cradle songs, her affection flowing generously from father to daughter, uncle to nephew. So all were being taken care of by Nangelipan. Father, daughter, uncle, nephew. Everyone be, were being taken care of by Nangelipan. Every child in the family grew up under her care. And yet when she fell seriously ill in her 73rd year with rheumatic pains, rheumatic means concerned with arthritis, you know, painful disorder of joints, joints. So ill in her 73rd year with rheumatic pains and chills, our foster mother had no home that she could call her own. So until she fell seriously ill you know, in her 73rd year, you know, she had no home that she could call her own. And that is the time probably when she was you know, uh, thrown out of the house, sent away from the house. You know, foster mother, uh, as you know, is a person who gives parental care, you know, though she is not uh, related to the child uh, by blood. When Nangilipan left us, my youngest brother, the eighth in the family, was three years old. She bade him place a tilagam on his forehead. Tilagam means a mark, you know, that you wear on your forehead. Tilagam on his forehead, dressed him in a silk shirt and trousers and kissed him, a eyes full of tears. So uh, the eighth child in the family was probably probably the last child that Nangeli Panna took care of. And when she left the house, you know, she kissed him with her eyes full of tears. Who will be Nangeli Panna's baby now? And this is what she is sad about. She is not sad about the disease that she has, the health condition that she has, but she is sad about whom she will take care of. Who will be Nangeli Panna's baby now? He was my mother's last child. There would be no more babies in the Tarawad. Nangeli Panna was old and sick now and she no longer wanted to stay in a house where the other servants jeered at her. Jeered means to laugh with contempt, to look down upon someone with contempt. So there were other servants in the house and they used to jeer at Nangeli Panna. And she didn't want to stay at that place also for this reason. She was far too proud to stay where she was not needed. All the same, she was unutterably sad when she said goodbye to us. She kissed each of us children in turn and then asked me in a voice choked with tears, Will you think of me, child, when you are married and living happily with your husband? I'll come for your wedding. So these are the bidding remarks. Now, while she bids adieu to the house, she you know, ask these questions. She makes a she made a statement earlier. Now, who will be Nangeli Panna's baby now? And she also asked this question to the narrator. Will you think of me, child, when you are married and living happily with your husband? And she says, I'll come for your wedding. I was furious. I hated anyone talking to me about marriage. Two of my younger aunts had recently been married and both had left the house weeping. So look at the impression that the child got, you know, after witnessing these events or these events. You know, this is also an indicative of how a child sees marriage. She sees it as something that brings sorrow, and she believed that you know, it is because uh, marriage brings sorrow that uh, two of her aunts who got married earlier uh, they left the house weeping. They seldom came home now. Who would look after my flower pots, my pictures, my cupboard, my books if I went away as they had done? So this is you know, the concern that the child has. Who will take care of all my assets in the house? My pictures, my cupboard, my books. Who will take care of that if I go away? So she got furious when Nangeli Pannu talked about her marriage because you know, then uh, the, as a child she did not want to get married. Because, because she had, you know, previous experiences, bad experiences, you know, uh, with regard to her aunt's, aunt's marriage. In that case, I said gruffly. Gruffly means in a rude manner, in a rough manner. 
I said gruffly to Nangeli Pen, "You need never come back." And I moved away from her. So she got so disturbed with Nangeli Pen making a remark to her marriage that she, you know, speaks rudely to Nangeli Pen. She says, "You need never come back. You don't have to come back here again. You don't have to come back and attend my wedding." And the narrator moves away from her. She often asks my eleven-year-old brother, "When you have got your BA and all, what will you give Nangeli Pen?" He det- detested her, would never go to her. So you know, when uh, her brother grew up, Nangeli Pen asked him, "When you have your education and all, what will you offer your Nangeli Pen?" And you know, the, her brother. the narrator's brother he detested such expression such questions from nangeli pen and this made her brother never to return to nangeli pen she ne- he never went to her get away from me you will stain my clothes with your snot snot means nasal mucus in the end nangeli pen realized what had happened all the little ones whom she had hatched in the loving warmth of her hands had become birds that soared in the skies you know so in the skies means they have become grown ups now and that is why she gets such remarks such responses from them they would find tall trees to build nests in they would revel in the wide firmament firmament sky they would never come back to the little nest of broken twigs they had once been content with so once you know the children they were content with the uh, nest of broken twigs it refers to nangeli pen nangeli pen is referred to as the nest of broken thing twigs and these children they were satisfied with this nest with nangeli pen but now they have grown their wings and they will find tall trees where they can build their own nest and they will they would revel wild in the firmament firmament they would you know uh, live their own life in this particular world they would never come back to the little nest of broken twigs they had once been content with content with means to be satisfied with so nangeli pennu she understands uh, the reality the fact one of nangeli pennu's distant relatives had a granddaughter who had a baby every year she wouldn't go out to work because of the little ones nangeli amma arrived and took charge over the next 4 years she had the good fortune to have five babies to care for none of the children wanted their mother they preferred their new grandmother so everywhere she went she was you know the one, the one person that was dear to all children uh, even to uh, her distant relatives granddaughter who had a baby every year uh, even to that particular family even to the children that was born by that particular girl you know they considered nangeli pennu as their mother the years went by despite all my protest i had to give in and get married and this also you know in a way points out to the social setup during those days and perhaps even now where you don't have you know much say regarding your marriage especially with re- respect to women so this you know it occurred in an intense manner earlier and that is what is being you know referred to here by the author the years went by despite all my protest i had to give in and get married nangeli pennu did not come to my wedding instead her granddaughter brought us the news it started with a fever and a chill she didn't even last 2 hours oh amme the little one is still crying she refuses to eat because she wants her grandmother so this is where we understand that nangeli pennu is no more one of her, her granddaughter she brings them the news that she passed away she did not even last for 2 hours when she contracted you know a severe fever and the little child she he the child does not take food because you know she wants her grandmother in time i had a baby too i hunted everywhere for a live wooden cradle that would keep my child away from fire and water calm him when he cried and look after him with care the memory of nangeli pennu came alive again and touched my heart the old servant had been dead for years enough 
No one like her could be found in our part of the country. Her granddaughter had her own children and grandchildren to look after. Indeed, all the mothers and grandmothers I knew had children of their own to take care for. So, the author was a child earlier. She grew up. She got married. She has a baby for her of her own now, and she wanted somebody to take care of her. She wanted a foster mother. She tried searching everywhere, but she could not find anyone. Look at how the author addresses Nangeli Pirna or foster mothers, a life wooden cradle. Uh, this is something that I pointed out earlier. The wooden cradle, no, it is actually, or towards the end of the story, it turns out to a symbol for all such foster mothers. After a long and arduous search, arduous means an intense, something which is done with great effort. After a long and arduous search, I found someone named Bhanumati. She was 14, had never handled babies before. So the person, the nani, the ayah, the foster mother that uh, the narrator found, she was 14 years old and she was named Bhanumati. And there was a problem, she had never handled babies before. And she was a, herself a child. When the baby cried, she would not come anywhere near to him. So this is the kind of foster mother that we have now. Uh, when the baby cried, Bhanumadi, she would never, she would, she would not come to the baby. And this, you know, marks a difference between the earlier uh, foster mothers and the ones that we have now. And anyway, it would have been no use if she did. The baby burst into tears every time he saw her cross face. So the foster mother. Bhanumadi, she had a cross face, which means a, an annoying or you know an angry face. She was quite she was quite annoyed with the baby's cry. Cries, you know, when Bhanumadi came near the child, the child would cry again because the child saw Bhanumadi. So that is the kind of foster mother that the narrator has as of now. I caught myself remembering the innumerable ways in which Nangeli Perna used to coax a fractious child. Cox means, you know, gentle caressing that you do. Cox a fractious child means, fractious means, you know, stubborn or annoyed or disturbed. So the author remembers the innumerable ways in which Nangeli Panna used to cox a fractious child into good humor. Again, how Nangeli Panna used to comfort a child who was disturbed. And that too in, num in innumerable ways. She would twist her lips in an expression of reproach. Reproach means a mild rebuke or criticism. Widen her eyes, hold out her arms and say, Did you hear the drums, little one? So these are the ways uh, which were used by Nangi Lipana to settle down, to calm down, to coax a fractious child, a disturbed child. There he comes, the Kavadi man. With a young moon in his hair, he comes on a blue peacock. Velavan, my saviour. Hara haro, hara hara. So Velavan, as you know, is... Lord Vale Murugan. And you know what Kavadi is. I hope I don't have to explain. So these are the remarks that she makes so as to comfort a little child. If you don't come with me, little one, Nangeli Panna will go off by herself. Which child could resist her invitation? So this is the kind of you know uh, remark that she made. If you don't come, you know, I will go away. And this was an invitation that, that you know, could not be denied by or could not be resisted by any child. From our upstairs window, we could see the Nagamala range enveloped in clouds. Two strange rock formations had, that looked like demons covered in smoke lay between two of its peaks. So you have the wonderful descriptions of you know, the sight that you can see when you looked out of the window upstairs. You could see the Nagamala range and you could see two strange rock formations that looked like demons. They were known as Pandi and Pandiyati. Whenever a child cried, Nangeli Panna would say, Look at Pandi and Pandiyati. God turned them into rocks because they were obstinate and willful. So this is the story that she narrated to the children. If you are obstinate and willful, willful means disobedient, you know, then perhaps God will turn you into rocks just like he did with Pandi and Pandiyati.
The most disobedient child would give in to this threat for no one wanted to turn into a rock that could not move. And then, of course, Nangeli Pannu had to repeat the oft-told story once more with new embellishments. So whenever she warned little children about God turning them into rocks just like Pandi and Pandiyati, the next thing that the children would ask was to narrate the story of Pandi and Pandiyati. She would sit on the floor, her legs outstretched, eager to start, and the children would crowd around her, their eyes wide with delight, saying, Tell us, how did Pandi and Pandiyati turn into rocks? Drumming gently on her knees, the old storyteller would begin. So once she wants them, she, ha she also had to narrate the story. And she would sit down and start narrating the story. Once upon a time, in the kingdom of Pandi, there lived a king and a queen. The king had a gold chariot that took him wherever he wanted to go. And the queen had a gold chain that gave her whatever she wished for. One day they came to hunt in Nagamala. The king, tired and thirsty after a long day's hunt, sat down on a rock. There was not a drop of water anywhere near. He prayed, Lord of Nagamala, if a pond appears here now, I will make you a handsome offering. Amazing! A spring gurgled toward them from the top of the mountain. They took a handful of water in the hollow of their hands and drank, and their hunger and thirst were quenched. So when the king asked for a blessing, it was immediately bestowed to them by God. The exhausted queen prayed, Lord of the mountain, if you build me a palace here, I too will make you a worthy offering. So the king, he asked for uh, some water and he and they got it and the queen asked for a palace so that that they can take rest astonishing a seven story mansion appeared magically so the blessing was bestowed upon them immediately its floor was of gold its walls of precious gems the king and the queen slept in it and woke up on the third day they were loath to leave loath means no they detested they hated no, they did not want to leave the place. The king said, If I still sell the entire Panti kingdom, which was the king's kingdom, no, I will never have as much gold as there is here. Let's take as much as we can in our chariot. The queen said, I will not find a single gem as lovely as these in the whole treasury. I must have one for my chain. Disgusted with their cupidity, now, cupidity means extreme greed for material wealth. So the god got disgusted with their cupidity, with their extreme greed for material wealth. And you know what the god did? God decided to punish them. You can stay here forever and enjoy the gold and the gems. And he turned them both into rocks. So you see my children how evil greed can be. So this is a story that Nangeli Pannu narrated to the children. And she even had a moral at the end to share. So you see, my children, how evil greed can be. So this is how you know uh, greed will turn out. This is how greedy people will become in the end. These grandmother's tales, which have their origin in superstitions, stay long in our minds, complete with a moral that is related to life. But the women who narrated them, women like Nangeli Panna, are no more. Today's children no longer have old-fashioned wooden cradles. So we come to the present now. We were being narrated events of the past as the story began. As the narrator said at the very beginning that these are events that took place a long time ago. We have we come down to the present and she you know talks about the present state of affairs regarding foster mothers and you know wooden cradles. But the women who narrated them, women like Nange Lipenda, are no more. Today's children no longer have old-fashioned wooden cradles. They have pretty bunched ones of fine net. Old sweet country songs have been forgotten and recorded music has taken their place. So the narrator talks about the changes that have come over with the modern generation. 
what are the kind of thing that experience as they uh, when they are child or when they are children but the heart of a child does not change one day when thunder roared and rain swished down my son swished down my son asked me what is that thudding on the roof amma thudding means you know sound of sound that comes when you hit something you know uh, hard with uh, some tools some uh, something very hard so the child asked to the mother who is our narrator what is that thudding on the roof amma i knew what it was sea water becomes water vapor rises cools and falls as rain when clouds collide sparks of electricity are ignited and there is lightning and thunder so the narrator who is now an amma she knows what exactly that sound is she knows the uh, stages through which you know water is converted into rain and how thunder occurs but look at how she responded to the child's question i knew but all the same i said to him it is the lord of the sky is making ready for war so she repeats something that was you know once narrated to her by her foster mother who is nangeli pen so that is where the story ends the story as i said earlier is a tribute to all those nangeli pen who dedicate their lives for the well being of the little children they take care of the wooden cradle symbolizes such foster mothers who make numerous sacrifices for their children we might not realize their importance then but we would we will certainly realize it when we have children it is perhaps the others crave to have nannies like nangeli penna who could hear the heart of a child and fill them with fantasy and love that is being reflected you know in her final answer to her own child it is a lord of the sky is making ready for war so thank you so much we come to the end of this particular live session let me thank all who joined me here today for the live session i will see you during the next live session and in the next live session i will discuss uh, one of the stories written by c i p n which is spectral speech thank you everyone have a nice day